just going to present um, a bit of my PhD research, um, which just focuses on different kinds of mapping tools that can be used for stakeholder engagement in environmental decision making. Um, I'm in my third year of my PhD at the moment at the Countryside and Community Research Institute, um, but currently doing a, a bit of a placement and some work for Natural England, which I'll explain later on. Just wanted to start with just kind of the end, if that makes sense, with some kind of very key recommendations. Uh, and this is sort of the goal of, of what my PhD is doing. So stakeholder engagement or public engagement basically is um, considered in the, in the remit of this project as any kind of way to engage uh, members of the public or other key stakeholder groups. So that can vary considerably, local authorities, charities, other organisations, uh, in environmental decisions which could affect them, so their lives. Uh, and this could be anything from like flood management, uh, conservation, uh, natural resource management and so forth. So we produced some sort of key recommendations for engaging public and stakeholder groups uh, in environmental decisions. And this is sort of through collaboration with Natural England, this work that we've been doing. Uh, and there are sort of some key points about what's important to consider. And this is for environmental practitioners um, or kind of for wider policy making around environmental issues. And there's kind of lots of things to do with taking time to understand the local context in which engagement's carried out. Some of the other presenters have really made that very clear. Things like engage the public early on in decision-making processes, make you know, them feel like their opinion means something, that the decision hasn't been made already. Recognizing the importance of integrating different knowledge types, so particularly kind of local or lay knowledges and scientific knowledge. Managing different power dynamics, so this can be between different members of the public or this could be between the policymaker maybe and the public. Thinking about, uh, you know, length and time of the engagement process and how that affects the quality of engagement. And then number six, which is sort of what I'm focusing on in this presentation, is recognising that different digital, remote and in-person tools, so uh, different tools and approaches, will work differently in different situations and there will be different outcomes. So it's important to be able to understand why that is. Uh, and then number seven, we kind of thought, you know, it's, it's really important uh, for engagement coordinators and those are people responsible for maybe instigating the engagement process. They need to manage realistic expectations. So, you know, what promises are they making from engaging with the public and can they keep them? And what are the considerations for that with regards to resources or financial constraints and so forth? not just for the organisation maybe initiating engagement, but for the public as well, there are going to be restraints for them being involved. And then finally, you know, these kinds of cultures or frameworks for engagement, if you like, do need to be institutionalised within environmental organisations for them to work in the long term. So kind of going backwards from that, as you can probably tell, very keen on having um, outputs um, from these projects that um, have kind of wider relevance for research policy and practice. So just really briefly, I won't go into too much depth here, but there are lots and lots of uh, documents being circulated at the moment. These are some recent ones uh, and some slightly older ones uh, where public engagement is highlighted as really key. And there's lots of messages, you know, that um, the public have a right to be involved in decisions which affect them. Um, the uh, Planning for the Future white paper, which I've, uh, I think I've just put down there, they explicitly talk about um, mapping tools uh, and other kind of, um, geolocated information tools uh, for engaging the public and talk about sort of how that can be used um, within the context of the planning sector. So there are lots of different sort of reasons for doing it in terms of uh, a policy uh, and other kind of decision making sense. And before I go on, one key part of this is being really clear about concepts and terminology because there are so many different terms that can be used around engagement or participation. So, you know, this is not just with sort of public engagement in general, but also with internet enabled or ICT based geo participation and so forth. There are loads of different terms and loads of different definitions that mean different things to different people in different areas. I guess one of the broadest definitions that we've been working with is that engagement is a practice of consulting and involving members of the public in agenda setting, decision making and policy forming activities of organisations and institutions. So that can include research as well. And then more specifically, so this is the um, kind of definition that I follow uh, in, in this research is that engagement is a process where individuals, groups and or organisations 
can choose to take a role in decisions which affect them. So basically they're, you know, they're able to be involved in a decision. And this can be two different types, maybe more focused engagement, which is, um, you know, with a specific project. So you might seek um, particular stakeholders that um, have a stake in a, in a particular project or decision-making process or research project, or you can do wider engagement. So this could just be for information provision, um, which still counts as engagement. And that could be a public awareness campaign, an environmental campaign and so forth, that you would want to reach wider public groups. And there are of course other types like consumer engagement and all sorts of things, but we don't count those things here. And there are different pros and cons to engaging the public. Uh, and it's important to sort of think about what the role and influence of digital and more specifically to this presentation, geoparticipatory tools. So that's kind of using different mapping tools like we've kind of seen some examples earlier on, participatory mapping uh, to engage the public in environmental decisions. So I won't go into these um, kind of benefits and risks in too much depth, but it's important to know that there are, you know, different considerations to think about here. You know, on one hand, um, you know, very normatively and democratically, people do have a right to be involved in decisions that affect them. And I think that's very strong, uh, strong rationale that's used quite a lot. Um, it's good to have decisions that are representative of diverse voices. It's good to be able to empower different stakeholders through the co-production of knowledge, you know, not just having uh, decisions made on scientific knowledge, but also including the voices of local people. Um, and then other, you know, promoting trust uh, in some cases, you know, creating a sense of ownership over the process is important, uh, particularly for maybe energy development and that kind of thing. And then on the other hand, there are lots of risks. Um, you know, this can legitimise top down decision making. Um, it can be viewed by some people as kind of tokenistic or a means to an end. So that could be when people might feel that the decision has already been made. You can end up underrepresenting different groups, marginalizing different groups in the process who perhaps are already marginalized in society. Um, and it can also, you know, be complex and confusing for a lot of people, overly technical to engage, particularly around very scientific environmental issues. And that can require different knowledges and skills. Um, so there are lots of different considerations here. And I guess the key point is that these considerations sort of, whilst they're true for engagement in general, using kind of any sorts of tools. When you're using digital and also mapping tools, there are another set of considerations here. So these might be true as well, but there are some other things that practitioners and researchers can think about when they're engaging. So just a brief bit about uh, what I'm sort of considering as a geo participatory tools here. Uh, is obviously there has been a big uh, growing reliance on technology anyway for delivering engagement that has been kind of accelerated if you like during the pandemic obviously uh, and this can include um, you know uh, during the pandemic lots of people engaging webinars zoom or those you know uh, uh, normal types of engagement if you like uh, and then online participatory mapping is a really big part of this particularly uh, for environmental decision making as well there are lots of examples of this and that's when you have geolocated inputs like comments or pins or images um, and it's used um, to kind of get people to submit their opinions about different projects and examples include web-based public participatory GIS applications, um, 3D landscape visualization, volunteer geographic information and other crowdsourced data collection, um, different kind of mixed methods and qualitative GIS approaches too um, so these obviously can be um, Kind of blended uh, digital and non-digital as well uh, and then geo participation is sort of very key here and that's using uh, different spatial tools to involve the public uh, providing an easy to use environment and social uh, engagement to promote belonging trust and the management of power dynamics um, so that's sort of a very key consideration here is you know how do these additional considerations about engaging the public in environmental decisions how can these sort of feed into wider understandings of geo participation and how we use different mapping tools to engage the public? I just wanted to, uh, I don't think I need to because we've already had some great collaborative mapping examples so far today, but just wanted to show what I meant when I was talking about these. So these are some more commercial maybe um, platforms at the top. You've got uh, Commonplace is a software company that um, has a collaborative mapping platform uh, in the UK and there are lots of really good examples on their website. Other examples include Bang the Table, Engagement HQ is their platform, 
Uh, and then, of course, there are other sort of, um, you know, free and open source examples uh, in research and beyond. Uh, this example I've just put was, uh, I think, some people from Natural England and ADAS, uh, and they use uh, participatory GIS to help sort of look at people's cultural values and landscape planning. So lots of different applications and uses of this. And um, obviously, sort of my research uh, originated looking at participatory mapping and changed completely during the pandemic because I was going to do walking interviews like Alid and I wasn't able to do that. So um, instead, I looked at sort of how uh, different experts, if you like, people using these tools during the pandemic, how their use and experiences of them changed during the pandemic. So obviously, it has really accelerated our use and reliance on digital tools uh, and was quite a unique opportunity for research, particularly because, you know, the pandemic um, has really pushed these inequalities relating to technology into the spotlight. You know, we now know who can engage online and who can't, and it's more obvious, uh, you know, these issues are a bit more um, obvious now than they were before. So, uh, and this also links to, you know, uh, the wider relevance policy and practice, as I mentioned earlier, uh, and also sort of in academia, there's lots around the changing role and influence of technology, uh, for example, in planning, um, planning 2.0 and 3.0, talking about, you know, the different uh, roles of ICTs um, in the ways that we engage. So kind of the next part of this will be talking about you know, my actual study. Um, so I've been talking for 10 minutes about that, but um, my study is kind of broken down into three core parts. I first conducted a survey, as I mentioned, my research changed very quickly at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, and I launched a survey just to look at some kind of key themes in how uh, engagement had uh, sort of changed during the pandemic with regards to the use of digital tools. And this captured quite diverse perspectives from academia policy and practice, sort of very much focused on researchers and public engagement professionals. And this included lots of directors and CEOs of different companies, consultancy firms, uh, different managers, planning professionals, consultants, policymakers, local authorities, and so forth, all involved with some kind of environmental or sustainability project in which they were actively engaging members or trying to actively engage members of the public in. And I produced some kind of key themes from this survey, which then informed a series of um, semi-structured interviews. I did around 40 of those last year. Um, and so the survey informed the questions that I asked and I sort of looked into key aspects um, of, of what people um, experienced, what went well, what, and what didn't during the pandemic. And this allowed me to pull out some more details about different tools in particular. So obviously um, the mapping tools um, was a core element. And then at the moment, as I mentioned, I'm doing some work with Natural England and that's taking these findings and applying them in a practical setting. So at the moment we're developing some key kind of messages and frameworks and stuff for Natural England. So how can we start to think about the different tools that are available? What are the key things that we need to think about? Um, how can we go from, you know, A to Z right from the beginning of the engagement process to the evaluation and beyond? Uh, what are the key things that we need to think about? What is best practice sort of in, in that sense? Um, I won't spend too long on this slide just because I don't want to run over, um, but basically, you know, no surprises here. Obviously, over 80% of people that I surveyed uh, had moved their in-person engagement online, lots of cancellations, um, and around a third of them had used some kind of geo-information tool. So the sorts of platforms that I showed earlier, like Commonplace or Engagement HQ, were very popular, as well as sort of, uh, you know, some people had developed their own tool or something within their um, company or organisation. And these were some of the themes that kind of emerged from the survey, which were used to inform the interview. So a lot about, you know, what are participants' experiences of the engagement process with regards to their needs and requirements? What are the barriers? Um, what do they consider to be more successful? Is, is the engagement process more successful when it's online or face-to-face? -face? Uh, and then lots of other things regarding, you know, the differences between online and face-to-face -face engagement, like privacy and security concerns, um, lots of people saying, you know, they wanted a more blended approach of online and face to face, depending on the situation, different considerations regarding accessibility uh, and then sort of the flow of information as well, like um, how well can people talk basically in online spaces compared to face to face. And I explored these um, themes in a bit more depth in uh, or a lot more depth sorry, in a um, series of interviews. Uh, and these are just some of the kind of headline themes that came out of that. 
So lots of people did talk about different accessibility issues um, with regards to different um, digital tools in general, but here we're talking about the kind of geo participatory tools. So obviously, you know, accessibility issues with regards to people's access to internet, people's ages, um, where people are living, other kind of uh, demographic and socioeconomic characteristics uh, were discussed. So the kind of output of this is I've been putting together different kind of case studies, you know, in this situation with this tool, these are the considerations, this is what went well and what didn't. Let lots of people talking about different skills and resources. So this is relevant to digital and spatial literacy, like people's um, digital skills and computer skills, but also people's uh, ability to understand maps uh, and interpret maps in the correct way. And, you know, who's involved in that um, and what you can do as an engagement coordinator, you know, managing that engagement process to sort of think about these things and make sure that the people who are involved are all sort of have that same opportunity to engage uh, in these online um, mapping spaces. Lots of people also commented on um, elements of geoprivacy and the ethics of using location data. Um, and you know, what are the differences for if you had a non-mapping engagement platform compared to a platform with mapping elements, you know, especially when things like photographs are involved, do people be encouraged to upload photos of their local area on a platform? What are the additional considerations that you need with regards to that? And this then links to having, you know, um, on one hand, you might have lots of benefits associated with having a big mapping platform with lots of people's um, input over time. You know, I know that companies like Commonplace have, they've got these huge databases of lots of people's um, input with lots of different developments and changes in lots of different areas over a period, big period of time. They've just got a huge amount of information now about people's perceptions of different developments and applications and changes to their natural environment. So on one hand, that's great. You've got a lot of information that you can very quickly access. But on the other hand, there's lots of questions about, you know, uh, how is that data stored? Where is it stored? Um, who has uh, the rights to edit it? Who has the rights to view it? And that links to things like control and commercial accountability. So, you know, what can you trust and not trust? Is it more trustworthy to have something that's perhaps more open or, um, you know, there are lots of different considerations around that, I think. Um, I'll just whiz through the next two, but there was um, a lot of talk about different kind of levels of social interaction, community and shared learning. Um, in these spaces. So uh, I think one of the most key things that sticks in my mind is, you know, in online spaces, you might have a bit more rehearsed points if you're typing your uh, input into a collaborative map, particularly if it's facilitated in other ways as well. You might have a more rehearsed like response that you're putting in there compared to if it was, you know, a, um, you're drawing on a map in a group of people in a communal environment where your ideas are tested and bounced off other people and you might have a different, perhaps more well-rounded um, uh, knowledge and information going on in that space. And then, of course, final point, kind of self-explanatory, uh, self um, is uh, innovation, diversity and fragmentation. So on one hand, you've got loads of different tools available, lots of uh, innovative ideas. On the other hand, it's really confusing for a lot of people. There's too much stuff. This is true for both public and kind of, you know, organisations initiating engagement. There is just so much out there and the tools can be quite fragmented and disjointed. And it can be difficult to know, you know, what information do you get and where do you get it about what you should be using and why. Um, I will just skip over this because I think it was just, um, you know, the core message from uh, what I was going to say here is just, you know, the need to develop flexible, adaptable and very blended approaches to engagement. So this is moving away from maybe, um, you know, an idea that there might be a one size fits all or like a gold standard of engaging, you know, I, I think just having a bit of an open-minded and flexible approach to these things is always going to be beneficial, thinking about what really suits not just the organisation in terms of the resources and the capacity to engage, but the public as well, you know, what demographic you're trying to engage with, what barriers and opportunities might exist there, and how might you move past them to try and include everybody in that process. Um, and then I've already sort of mentioned this, but um, the next stage is uh, I'm doing some interviews in Natural England to sort of figure out uh, cultures of engagement, you know, people see engagement in different ways in different places. And I think it'd be really interesting to tap into that to look at the potential of kind of rolling out some best practice recommendations around this. Uh, and this will be like tested and evaluated by different Natural England staff over the next um, uh, year or something like that. 
And then kind of finally, just some key messages, uh, I guess, again, you know, I, I will be thinking about the implications of the messages from this research for sort of wider geoparticipation, e-participation, public participatory GIS, thinking, you know, where does this bring together this kind of knowledge, bringing it into the environmental arena and what are the key considerations for practice? Um, and, you know, just really like working to actively include the voices of um, people who might hold less power in society, how you recognise that. And then, you know, once they're identified, you can then go to the absolute variety of different research they have out there about what tools are good for who and why. Um, you know, there's so much out there. And, but I think people, you just need to join the dots in that sense. Um, and then, you know, obviously a really key message, which I mentioned earlier, is this. Uh, embedding social inclusion, collaboration and mutual learning into environmental decision making processes and institutionalizing cultures of engagement is a really key thing there. And there are my contact details uh, in case anybody would like to get in touch. Um, I have a very quick question. Uh, it's, it's great to hear about, you know, some of the problems there are so many different options around about what can be done and what's best practice and the rest of it. Have you come across the Lotus Charter at all? Lotus Charter? Yeah. No, I haven't. So this is very, very new. It's only been out a couple of weeks and it's a new kind of ethical framework for doing geo-related work. Um, they've, they're trying to develop a kind of ethical geo standard almost. Uh, so that's definitely worth checking out from the kind of privacy point of view. I'll see if I can dig out a link and stick it in the chat. That geospatial committee, I think I've seen something on Twitter yes, about yes. it. Geovation yeah. and the geoplace, I think. I can't remember. I'll, I'll yeah. think out. Yeah, yeah, I think I've seen that. Yeah. We uh, have a question from Alid. Uh, really interesting presentation. Thanks, Caitlin. Do you think we will get past the word engagement soon? It seems that participation is much better defined and thought through as a term. I think that, I mean, it depends which area again, but I would say that participation or participatory research is broader Then you have participatory methods. Engagement is very much um, uh, an umbrella term which can include different participatory methods, consultation methods and collaboration methods. And that's all defined on the, the extent of the flow of information between different participants or who's involved. So I don't think that engagement is something that you need to get past in that sense. I think you just need to be clear about what you're interpreting as engagement, what it includes and doesn't include within particular settings. Um, yeah, I, I just think the word engagement is used everywhere all the time right now. And I, I just, I find it a bit frustrating to be honest. And I, I think that, um, I, I, yeah, participation has been pretty well defined and thought through over the years. I, I agree with Caitlin that, you know, it, it's kind of like engagement is wide, participation might be a smaller part of it, but I don't know. I, I feel like the word's been hijacked politically and I'm not sure if it's much longer for this world and it'll be ditched and it'll be subbed for some other word. <laughs> I wonder what that word will be. Yeah. Great. Um, we've got a question from Chris with the proposal that 2021 census might be the last census. Public participation may be the way to conduct future large scale population surveys. Do you think this will result in the same level of quality as the current census? Um, I mean, that's not really my area, sort of including engagement here as specific kind of public and stakeholder engagement with different uh, projects. But um, in terms of uh, I don't know, collecting data from the public, which I guess this is, I'm not sure that's how much that is engagement because you're collecting information from people, right? And, and engagement would be uh, if you were trying to do it for an education or, an, a, a, you know, a, a, an awareness raising purpose. So I'm not really sure I can comment too much on that. I know, you know, some examples of awareness raising might be, um, using different hashtags on Twitter or trying to raise awareness about uh, climate change, um, some things that Natural England has done that I know of, but my um, knowledge is, is way much more seeing engagement and participation as a more formal process by which, um, you know, different public and stakeholder groups are involved in decisions that might affect them. Cool. 
Yeah, no, I, I, I quite agree. Um, uh, Chris, if you want to expand on that, feel free. I'm happy to put my two pennies in. Um, we often hear that this census is going to be the last census. We heard that in 2011 as well, when we had that census. Um, most of the talk is, will it, will it be replaced by administrative data? And I think the jury's still out on that. There's various discussions, and I think the ONS are going to make some sort of statement in 2023 about their plans for that. Um, but to me, a, a census is a very different way of engaging to a lot of the public participation that we talked about here. And it, you, get, you get very different answers from that. Uh, and I would say they're probably uh, quite different. And so it's, it's quite tricky to compare them. 